If he woke you up this morning, give him praise. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be together? However, we have to get together. Let's just let's keep coming together, you know? Forsake not the assembly of ourselves together. And it's a difficult time to do that, but you know, when that Bible verse was written, they were being persecuted for their faith, cast out of their community. And so I'm just so grateful that we live in a time where God has enabled us to share the message with you. And I'm excited. I'm excited to share God's word today. Honestly, sincerely. Not in that preacher kind of way. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to share the. No, not in a formal way. I really, really have something today that I want to share with you. And I pray that God would enable me to speak it. Of course, I want to do a few shout outs real quick before we transition. If I would have known we were going to break it down like that, I wouldn't have worn this flannel. It is. I'm starting to sweat up here. Praise the Lord. Where are you, com where are you coming uh, from today? I know church is coming to you. you. You aren't coming to church today, but church is coming to you. Somebody tell me where you're watching from today. Um, okay, I see somebody from Northeast Pennsylvania. Tell me your name, your first name, or what, what your friends call you, because we're going to be friends. All right? Be friends. And tell me where you're watching from. Your first name or your nickname, if it's appropriate, and where you're watching from. And if it's hard to say, give me a pronunciation, God, because I'm really bad at that. I'm trying to get through this, but it's coming really fast. I see Hong Kong, Jamaica, the UK, Boston, India, London. Even if you're watching this later, put it in the comments because I'll go through and read all of them. And when I'm bored, it'll give me something to pray for. I can pray for you. I can look at your name and pray for you, and I'll know where you're from. And that'd be cool. Michigan, Oklahoma, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Romania. You know, this always amazes me. Brazil, Dubai, Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy. Isn't that a Pearl Jam song? Let's see. We got Todd from Orlando. Hey, everybody, do me a favor. I want you to say happy birthday to Chunks Corbin. He goes by Chunks. And he's not, he's not overweight. That's the thing about it. He's ripped. He turned 43 today. He was walking around like he's 77, though. He says, my hoop flexor. But everybody say happy birthday, Chunks, because it's, it's Holly, Amy, and Chunks are out here. Of course, we, we don't have a lot of people here. Um, I think it's responsible for us to have as few people as possible, but I just want to put some people that I love in the room just to remember that we're not alone. So happy birthday, Chunks. They're saying it from all over the world. I wish you could see it. Wow. This is more people than lived in Fernandina Beach where you grew up just saying happy birthday. Are you watching it? Happy birthday, man. Come on. I'm not going to sing it to you. Chunks, you still got joy? Even though you got an aching back and aching knees? torn rotator cuff, but you still got joy because the world didn't give it? What kind of joy? Oh, that's Bible joy, Chris. Not like endorphins, but… That kind of joy? I still got joy. Unspeakable, full of glory. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy unspeakable, full of glory. Joy in the Holy Ghost. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. The things that can't be changed and will never be taken away. I pray for all of these who are gathered today, just even closer than if they were in the building. Lord, I thank you that. The voice of your word is reaching right now to all of these men and women, Desiree and Rhonda and Sean and Belinda and Bill and Dennis and Shelley in Singapore and in Canada. And I thank you that your joy is reaching right now. We will rejoice in you and boast in you and trust in you in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you're allowed to hug the person that you're with, go ahead and give them a big hug, and let's get into the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. 
Wow. Hey, I'm still getting used to this. This is still very new to me, like preaching to just empty seats, but it's kind of cool because obviously there's more people running cameras today than when I started preaching. And one cool thing about going through something that feels new is it makes you access something that that you may have started to take for granted. Like little things, you know, you find yourself grateful for little things. And um, you know, there's probably a lot of us who are getting in touch with some things inside of ourselves during this time, more maybe more than we want. It's like, oh, I I just don't want to be alone with myself. And um, I'm kind of I'm kind of cool with not having to be around too many people right now. Um, and I and I don't say that in a flippant way. I know that uh, it's a very serious situation in our world, but I was telling my friend the other day, I've been, I've been trying to find a way to stop hugging people for a couple of years. I don't, like, I don't like hugging anymore. I used to like hugging, and now I only like to hug people with last name Furtick. And so I've been looking for a way out for, for years, so that part kind of suits me. And, uh, but of course, one of the things that you really have to get used to is the contrast, like this right here is a contrast. When I preached last week, and I came off of the stage because remember, like, there's nobody out here. So I'm just looking at empty seats, and I have a screen with YouTube comments that's scrolling from uh, Penny and uh, South Africa and Cape Town and Derek from South Carolina. And while all this is happening, you know, I'm just preaching to. I'm not saying you're nobody, but there's not that many people out here. Of course, Holly's out here, and uh, one Holly is worth a million other people. And so I'm just working on my afternoon quarantine plans right now, starting early. But you know, aside from just having our amazing worship team and what a beautiful time that was in God's presence today, um, I'm not seeing anyone. So when I got off the stage last week, in a way, it was disorienting because uh, one of our staff members was asking me, "What did that feel like?" And I said, "It felt weird." But in a way, it felt familiar because, you know, when I started preaching, I would preach like there would be three kids, three seventh grade kids. You know, this is how I started. And I would just come out and preach, but I would try to preach like it was a Billy Graham crusade. And me and Chris grew up in small towns about two hours apart. And we used to play music, we both had bands, and we would play. Uh, music at, at Christian clubs. Let me tell you what, that's, that's a real paradox right there. A Christian club. And we played at one, I don't remember what it was called, Psalm 150 or P, PS 150 or something like that. It was named after some Bible verse. And, uh, but there'd be three people, five people, ten people was a, ten people was a stadium, you know? So for me, it's like, it's kind of getting back to my roots because I'm used to having to close my eyes to see. You know, when I used to preach, the kids would be like not paying attention, and uh, probably because I wasn't interesting. But I would have to close my eyes and just and just pre pretend, or, or maybe it was something different than pretending. Maybe I was just closing my eyes in order to have a perspective that didn't come from what I saw with my natural eyes. And so last week it was kind of cool because I was preaching and I was picturing people just gathered together and need a word from God and need encouragement. And I was picturing people that, that normally may not come to church, but, but they need something for their soul during this time, and there's very little other options for entertainment. So here they come over, and I'll be picturing people that, that maybe they've been drinking too much to numb the, the anxiety, or, or maybe they've been fighting a lot in the house, or maybe they've been lonely all by themselves. So I'm preaching kind of to an empty room, but when I walked off the stage, my staff member said to me, what did it feel like to preach to the the most people you've ever preached to in your life. I said, I didn't know I was doing it. He said, yeah. He said, the equivalent of who was on just at that live service, and this was just the first one on Sunday, it was the equivalent of Bank of America Stadium where the Panthers play. And he said there were so many people on that stream that it was actually Spectrum, which is where I went to see you too. That spectrum was the overflow room. That's how many people I was preaching to. And what I thought was weird was the contrast between what I was seeing with my eyes and what God was doing on the other side of the screen. 
And what hit me about it, and what I want to share with you about today a little bit, is that God was doing the most when I was seeing the least. And I want to bring a word to you today about how sometimes when we see the least, God does the most. Even when I don't see it, what were they singing earlier? You're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Uh, no offense to Brother Leland, I love his bridge that he put on the song, but I would even, I would even put a, put a, especially when I don't see it, you're working. Especially, doesn't sing as good, especially when I don't, probably should stay with even, but especially in those moments when I see the least, feel the least, watch this, know the least, understand the least. These are the spaces that God creates for revelation of who He is. How would I know He's a waymaker if I never needed a way made? How would I know He's a provider if I never had a need? How would I know that He was resurrection if I never experienced death? So we speak this word of the Lord to you today, and I want to come from a passage of scripture that I shared with our leaders on Friday night. We had a gathering of just under 5,000 of our leaders just to encourage and strengthen the church. And I was sharing along the lines of your position for a miracle. And I'd love for you to put that in the chat. I mentioned it last week. I'm positioned for a miracle. And then just put where you're coming from. You know, if it's, I see Wallyburg, North Carolina. I never heard of Wallyburg, North Carolina. I'm learning all kinds of stuff right now. I didn't know there was a Wallyburg. But God is positioning me. Say, I'm positioned for a miracle. And that means that. We have to learn how to see in our spirit what we cannot sense. And this is such an important skill that I want to devote my whole sermon to it today. Uh, let me read you this story, maybe familiar to you, maybe not, but just to jump right in the middle of it, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, the book says, When the servant of the man of God got up, and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city." Now, what he said next is something a lot of us have been saying. Maybe we've been using different words. Maybe we've been using stronger language, but he said, Oh, no, my lord. Oh, no. No, 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 no. How many of y'all moms, when you heard how long they were canceling school? Oh, no. No, no, no. How many of y'all, when you met with your financial advisor or clicked on your account, oh no, oh no. I wish y'all put that in the chat with a bunch of O's. Just say, oh no. I mean, just as many O's as your thumb can type. And we feel that way, you know, especially if we're, if we're worried about symptoms or if we're, if we're struggling in an emotional way. Oh no. And I love how that's right there in the Bible. His first response, he's a servant of the man of God, right? But his first response wasn't, praise God. His first response was, oh no. And we want to pretend to be real spiritual, you know? I see all your prayer emojis, but you've been having some other emojis too. You need to find that little devil emoji because really, you know what happened to the servant in the passage. And let me just take a moment to set this up. You got anything else to do? I don't have anything else to do. We may as well just hang out for a little while. But he woke up to a different world than the one he went to sleep in. He woke up to a different world than the one he went to sleep in, and he said, oh, no. Now, if you've ever woken up to a different world than the one you went to sleep in, you'll understand that it creates an impulse. Some people call it fear. I just call it humanity. It's just like… Oh, oh yeah. If you ever lost somebody, if, if they ever left your life suddenly, whether they died or just went away, and you woke up to a different world that didn't have them in it, like maybe you remember the first time you woke up in a world without your dad. Maybe you remember the first time you woke up in a world without a steady job. Remember the first time you woke up in the world without, you know, the NBA. I remember when they started canceling everything a couple of weeks ago, and I say it not in a humorous way, but when things get canceled that you used to count on, it makes you question everything. 
And so weather is something that we would say, oh, is entertainment or is this or it's that. It's just the feeling of like, oh no. And watch this question. It, it gets even more specific. What shall we do? Okay. So if that's where you find yourself today. I want to preach a message to you. What do I do? What do I do? And the servant asks the question, and the prophet gives the answer in verse 16. He says, Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed. And we're going to get this prayer today, and we're really going to pray it for the next seven days. Until I see you again in this format, we're going to pray this prayer over those that we love. And we're going to pray this prayer over ourselves. And here's the prayer. I've been putting this on all my text messages because I've got business leaders in my church that are like, oh no, what do we do? I've got doctors in our church that are like, oh no, what do we do? And I don't have the answer. So this is the prayer, okay? This is the prayer that I want us to pray right about now. Open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. Open his eyes, Lord, that he may see. Somebody put in the chat, open my eyes. Put in the comments, open my eyes. Those of y'all sitting on those stools behind me say, open my eyes. Open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And you know, I love that text so much. I love how God was protecting his servant. And I love how God was more powerful than the enemy. And I love how no weapon formed against us shall prosper. I love all of that, but sometimes when you're in a real situation or a circumstance, the cliches don't comfort you very much. I didn't know what to call this message. I don't know what we're going to call it when we put it online. We'll figure that out later. But uh, I did flash back just reading this passage to the other night. Abby, who is our nine-year-old, all of y'all who are part of the church, you kind of know my kids. I got a nine-year-old, 12-year-old, 14-year-old. But Abby um, is the most prone to come downstairs in the middle of the night and wake us up because she got scared. And she came downstairs the other day and she's, you know, trembling about something. Something fell over in the bathroom. And I wasn't quite asleep yet. If I had been totally asleep, I would have done the spiritual thing and said, Tell your mom. Uh, <laughs> True story, but uh, I still wasn't asleep. So I said, Come here, baby girl. You know, real good dad. And I said, Get up on my chest and sit here. I said, What's wrong? She said, I'm scared. Something fell over. Something's in the bathroom. I said, Baby, nothing's in the bathroom. And besides, even if it is, you're here with me now. I said, Feel this. And she gave me a little squeeze. Because we had this game we played the squishy wall, the bricky wall, the squishy wall, the bricky wall. Squishy, squishy, squishy wall. Bricky, bricky, bricky wall. I said, Feel the bricky wall. And so she started laughing a little bit, and she's still crying though. And I said, uh, "There's nothing in your bathroom, and even if there is, you're with me now." She said, "I'm still scared." <laughs> I love kids. I'm, I'm gonna call this message for just a minute. I'm still scared because you know, while it's easy to quote scriptures like, "Don't be afraid." Let's look at it for a moment and take a perspective because you know we're having a hard time even dealing with just a, a a virus right now but this is not an invisible virus this is horses and chariots that came to get the man of God in Dothan this is like I went to sleep we were good I woke up we were surrounded I went to sleep I had a job I woke up I didn't I went to sleep and things were well I woke up to a different world and he asked him a question and it's a reasonable question right this is the man of God this is the preacher this is the guy who speaks and and God provides this is the guy who speaks and God supplies so he asked the question to the right person he says what do we do now watch the answer that the man of God gives Elisha. He says, don't be afraid. Well, that's cute. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You know how people give you advice that makes you want to slap them? Well, I hadn't thought of that. And it's just, it's, this is the time for well-meaning Christians to shut up a little bit. You know, oh, well, you lost your job. God will provide. That's fine in certain contexts, but sometimes and I want you to see how Elisha does this. Sometimes it's more important 
what we don't do than what we do do. That didn't come out exactly right, but you know what I was trying to say. Sometimes, sometimes what I don't, what I won't do in a season where I'm uncertain is even more important than what I do because let's follow the text and I really want to take our time. We don't have another service coming in, so we could just we could just do this right. Put it back up. He said, What shall we do? And then the prophet said, Don't. And so go back to 15. What shall we do? And the prophet said, Don't. And the man said, What shall we do? And the prophet said, Don't. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What won't you do? In a time where so many are desperate and and, and we're all kind of fearful and, and we all feel scared. If you're not scared right now, I'm scared of you. If you're not scared right now, you are some kind of evil cyborg robot come to destroy the planet. And I want you quarantined, okay? Because to have flesh means to feel fear. So while he's wondering, what does this new world that I woke up to mean and what do we do? The prophet starts by saying, don't. Don't. So maybe for you it goes like this right now. I won't lash out at the people closest to me because of the fear that I feel about what's going on outside of me. Maybe it's like that. What won't you do? What a question, right? What do we do? Well, the first thing you've got to do is decide what you won't do. So I won't just make you know, irrational stories up in my mind. I won't spend three hours reading conspiracy theories on Twitter and then ask the Lord, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You, you gave your soul away that day. So what I won't do, what I won't do is spend time in the hypothetical. What I won't do. What won't you do? I would have been annoyed with the prophet. I'm just being honest, you know. Like, what do we do? What's the plan, man? What do you want me to do? Do we fight them? There's there's so many of them. It's just me and you. And by this time, Elisha's kind of old. You know, you can't fight. So it's just me versus all of them. What do we do? What's the plan? What's the what's the strat? What's the what, what do we do? What's the deal? What do we do? What 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 to do? All right. Don't be afraid. That's not working for me right now. How do I do that? How do I don't be afraid? I'm not afraid. 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 Still scared. <laughs> she said, I'm still scared. I know you're with me. I'm still scared. There's still something in my bedroom. I'm still nine. I'm still weak. I still got bills. I'm still got to show up at the grocery store and work. I still got a, a relative who's 84 years old who's starting to cough, and I wonder will I get to see her again. I'm still scared. So why does he say don't be afraid? Okay, I want to I want to teach a little bit. It's almost impossible to be strategic when you're scared. And so the first thing we have to do as people of faith, and I use that term not to mean as optimists or people who believe in fairy tales or people who float on clouds of cotton candy through the uh, burning seas of sulfur and suffering in this world because we know Jesus. I don't mean that kind of faith. I don't mean formulaic faith. I don't mean the, the answer kind of faith. I mean the better question kind of faith. What do we do? Okay. Well, what do we don't? We don't give way to despair, right? What good would that do? We don't. We don't. I know another thing we don't do. We don't minimize the sufferings of others. We don't do that. And how about this? Y'all talk to me out there. We don't compare what somebody else is going through with what we're going through. And and we don't start running around just saying dumb stuff. You know what we don't do? We don't get on YouTube and comment how this is God's judgment. We don't speak about things that we don't know. That's above our pay grade. It's the judgment of God. What? And somebody's mother died, and you want to be some kind of closet theologian, some kind of armchair rookie, amateur theologian? Keep your day job. God is God. So I'm not going to try to be God. That's his job. 
You remember Holly's story that she preached one time? She told about these uh, boys that were fighting. This is a good quarantine story, all right? For all of y'all that's got uh, real kids that don't have you know, halos and harps and all that. And they, they fight sometimes, even though you pray for them, they fight sometimes. They were fighting two brothers, and if I mess it up, you can, you can fix it for me. And the mom said, uh, What are y'all fighting about? And one of them had a sandwich and wouldn't cut it in half and share it. And she said, uh, Y'all need to share. Be like Jesus. Jesus would share. And uh, the boy that had the sandwich looked at it, and uh, he, he, he took a bite out of it and said, You be Jesus. <laughs> you can share. I'm going to take a bite. But when my wife preached that message, her message was, Let God be God. Let God be God. You be Jesus. You, you be humble. Uh, you be trusting. Jesus had a nevertheless attitude toward his relationship with his father. He was like, I don't, I, I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to drink this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So, so you be Jesus. But what I won't do in this situation is just as important as what I will do. So the Holy Spirit is on that statement right now. Reflect on it. What won't you do? What are we going to do? What won't you do? I won't live in fear. I may feel fear. I won't live in it. I may experience sensations of fear. I felt my breath getting short the other day before I stood up to preach. Somebody asked me, how long were you preaching before you stopped feeling scared? I said, I'm still scared. Every time I preach, I was shaking before I came out here today. Now I know how to control my shake so you don't see it. But my hands still shake when they're in my pockets. I mean, this is important to me. So somebody is discouraged, depressed. Somebody's on the on the edge, and I get to preach the word. Like that's important to me. I don't I don't want to be the weak link of what God wants to give to you. I I don't want to come out here and, and miss the mark of what God wants to say. I'm still scared, but it doesn't have to stop me. So what I'm saying is not that I won't feel fear, not that I won't have questions. Not that I won't sometimes in my mind when I'm praying prayers, I'm praying prayers that, that, that really don't even sound like prayers. I'm praying prayers like, oh crap. I'm praying prayers like, please God. I'm praying prayers. I'm not walking around the house all the time with my hands lifted, but I won't stop worshiping. I won't stop praising. Put it in the chat. I won't stop. I won't stop. I won't stop. That's what I won't do. I won't stop. I won't back down. I will not give in. I will not surrender. I will not give away my joy. I will not give away my peace. My peace was purchased with the blood of Christ. It's too expensive. You can't have it. It's too valuable. It's the only treasure I've got. It's the only thing that moths can't eat up and the thieves can't steal. I might be scared, but I'm still going to stand on the word of the Lord. I won't bow to your statue, Nebuchadnezzar. I won't bow. Put me in a fire if you have to. Put me, tie up my hands and throw me in a furnace. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They said, The God that we serve is able to deliver us, and we know that He will. But even if, somebody say, Even if, even if He doesn't, I will not bow. And the only thing the fire is going to do is burn off what you tied me up with. God said, I'm setting you free in this season. I'm going to use the fire to set you free. I'm going to set you free from addiction. I'm going to set you free from bad priorities. I'm going to set you free from distractions. So that's what the man said. He said, don't be afraid. You can feel fear. It can ride in the car, but it can't drive. I can't wait to hear testimonies on this message because you have been letting that joker drive. You have been letting you have been letting that crook, that robber, that thief, that devil have your life and your peace and your joy. And so he said, "Here's what we're not going to do." He said, "Don't be afraid." Now, who says it is just as important as what is said? How many will agree? So, if my 14-year-old says to me, "Don't worry, dad. God's got this." I'm like, "Eh, when my mom says it, it has more weight because of who said it. 
So Elisha's ministry, you have to remember, was a prophetic ministry. It was a prophetic ministry. It's not about telling the future. It's about seeing. It's about seeing. It's about seeing the invisible. Would you agree with me that one of the lessons God is trying to get us to learn right now, I'm sure there are many lessons that we'll understand because of what we're going through as a society, but would you agree with me that one of the lessons he's trying to get us to learn is that sometimes what we can't see is more important than what we can see? I mean, just even thinking about it, like how I stood on the stage last week and preached, and what was happening on the other side of what I could see was significant, and, and at the same time, the entire economy is rocking and reeling because of an invisible virus. And so the Bible started to get real to me when I thought about you know, scriptures that used to sound good, but now they make more sense. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness, principalities, rulers. What he's trying to say is that like, what we're fighting that we can see has to first be approached at the level that we can't see. And God is trying to show us some things today because watch this. Not only does he tell him, don't be afraid, and this is not coming from a man who has never had to face fear before. This is coming from a prophet who had to walk into a widow's house. If you want to do a Bible study this week, you know, if you just get tired of uh, what's that show that everybody on my staff is watching with the tigers? Tiger King. If you get tired of Tiger King, I'm going to be looking for a Netflix sponsorship check out of this. But if you get tired of watching that, read 2 Kings 4. Elisha, go, this is the same guy that said, Don't be afraid to the servant when they were surrounded by the armies of Aram who came to lock him up because of what he could see. He had to walk into a woman's house who said, I'm about to go into debt. Uh, my, my husband is dead. I have nothing to pay it with. And, and, and I have nothing in my house at all except a little oil. Now, this prophet Elisha had the ability to see in a little bit what the woman could not see because she was looking through a different lens. A lot of us have thought of faith as being this way that we manipulate God, but now we find ourselves in a season where we can't control almost anything. We can't control what's open and what's closed. We can't control at some level what happens in foreign markets that affects us at home, what happens in foreign places. So, in the season of what we can't control, we have to redefine faith. Right? Because I thought, I thought faith was like a lever. Picture this. And like when we pull the lever, you know, have faith. Give them a praise. <laughs> Give them a praise. You know, when praises go up, blessings come down. It's like transactional, right? It's like jackpot, Jesus. It's like yes, Lord. You know, like I'm gonna pray my kid's gonna make straight A's. I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna stop my headache's gonna go away. I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna pray, but see, faith is not a lever. Faith is a lens, a way of seeing your situation. And sometimes faith changes the situation. Sometimes faith changes the way you see the situation. Sometimes God changes it. Sometimes he changes me. But either way, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, come on, you're supposed to say the line. Y'all are the worship team after all. Especially when I don't see it. Even when I don't feel it, especially when I don't feel it and when I don't know it, what do I do? Don't be afraid. So, what the prophet told the woman in 2 Kings 4 is what he's practicing in 2 Kings 6. Some of us are getting to put into practice for ourselves what we preach to others. We preach about peace, we preach about God's power. Now we get to prove that what God showed us in the light is true in the darkness, that what God showed us on the mountain is true in the valley. That what God showed us the night before is still true the next morning. And when that woman went around to her neighbors and she got all these jars, right? And the oil started flowing, and the only limitation to what God could provide was her capacity to receive it. And that's still true. And so now Elisha knows that if 
this man's heart is filled with fear, he can't operate in faith. Because you can't be you can't be strategic when you're scared. And so that's why it's so important what he says next that we have a perspective. Put that in the chat. Perspective. This is a prayer for perspective. This is a prayer for perspective. I put it on Instagram the other day because the Lord told me that 2 Kings 6 17 is a prayer for perspective. Watch this. The servant was asking for protection. What do we do? God gave him perspective. What do you see? What do I do? Starts with what do you see? And if the enemy can keep you from seeing, if he can keep you from seeing the, the blessings, he can keep you stuck in a place of brokenness. If he can keep you from seeing the advantages or the opportunities, he can keep you running. That's, that's a very important thing is that when, you're, when your vision of who God is is obscured by what you're going through, something very small can block out something much bigger. Can I stay here a minute? Like you're going to say no. Something very small can block out something much bigger. How can I illustrate this? I'm going to try to illustrate this real quick. I know y'all aren't prepared for this, so for just a minute, I'm freaking out the camera people. But something very small, this is very small, but you, what you're supposed to see, you can't see. Pray for me, y'all. Yeah. Something very small. This is very small, right? It's very small. Something very small can block out something much bigger. Now you can't see anything that's supposed to be seen. Something very small. And maybe it's no coincidence that I'm using this iPhone that's got some of y'all with stomach ulcers because you won't come off of it and see what's right around you, or you won't use that Bible app. You got that other app open. What's it called? Insta Insta what? Huh? Insta 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 it's not Instagram right now. It's like Insta gross. It's like it just makes me feel if I stay on it too long, it's just like I'm in an alternate reality, and now I can't see what is invisible. Something small can block out something bigger. Okay, is that camera on? Y'all, we didn't plan any of this, so pray for your preacher right now. Pray for the cameraman. I'm still six feet apart, by the way. I want y'all to know that. But I'm just showing you this illustration how something small, and this is what 1 Kings 19 says about it. That Elijah, who was the great man of God who taught Elisha in 2 Kings 6 everything that he knows, because this is nothing new, because the same God that delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine too. The only reason Elisha knew what to see in the situation that he'd never been in before, he had followed the, the great man of God, Elijah, the prophet, the one who called down fire on Mount Carmel. You remember that Bible story, Sean? I mean, he said, if God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. Choose this day who you will serve. And God answered by fire, 850 false prophets, the prophets of Asherah had to, had to bow their knee. And, and then when, when Elijah got done with that, with that miracle, he went up on a mountain and prayed. Now listen to this about perspective. We're talking about perspective. He said, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. I hear something that I can't see. I know something that I can't see. And when his servant went to check the sky, he said, I know you said you heard something, but there's nothing there. And Elijah said to his servant, Well, we need to say to our soul, go back and look again. Go back and look again. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. I will say it again. Rejoice. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Check it again. Look again. Go again. Look again. Say it again. Say it again. In the chat. Say it again. In the comments. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. God is good. Say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it again. God is with me. Say it again. He has not left me. Say it again. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Say it again. He is the bread of life. Say it again. He's a way maker. Say it again. He's a miracle worker. And when he checked the seventh time, he saw something very small, a cloud the size of a man's hand. Something so small. Three and a half years of drought came to an end because of something very small. But you know what's weird? 
when Jezebel, Ahab's wife, Ahab was the wicked king. Jezebel was the one really running the show. Uh, one preacher said the last decision Ahab ever made was, I do. Because after that, Jezebel took over and she would kill the prophets. She was, she was much more ruthless than Ahab was. But when Jezebel heard what Elijah had done, she, she said, We'll put it up there on the screen, 1 Kings 19. She sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. I'm going to kill you. But she couldn't. She couldn't. There are certain things the devil can't do to you. But if he can get you to believe it, he doesn't even have to do it. If he can get you to get so blocked by something small, are you on this camera? Go back to this camera. Something, how could something so small? Look what Elijah, the great man of God, did in verse 3. So Elijah was afraid. He was afraid. So he fled and he ran and he ran and he ran because Jezebel couldn't kill him. So since she couldn't kill him, all she could do was convince him. And so I believe this message is prophetic, not pathetic, prophetic in the sense that you are allowing something small to block out something bigger. And I promise you right now, God's calling is bigger than any crisis. Trust me on that and read your Bible if you don't believe me. That's how I can go through it because I know that God's calling is bigger. And so why would I let something small block out something big? When he hung the stars and named them, why would I refuse to lift my eyes to the hills when I know where my help comes from? So there is something bigger. There is something greater. There is something other on the other side of this. I wonder what's on the other side of this that is so big that the enemy sent a storm to disrupt your peace, to destroy your joy. God is with us in this place right now. Do you feel that? And so the prophet said, those who are with us are more than those who are with him. He must have went to public school. This dude is bad at math. Elijah is bad at math. And the servant is like, huh? Because he's counting, right? He's like, those with us are more than those with them. All right. So one, two. And then he starts counting the enemy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Because I know somebody's sitting there listening, like, well, uh, uh, preacher, this is, this, is, this is cool. This is neat. But have you seen the news? I'm like, but yeah, I, I saw it. I see the statistics. But what good is it going to do for me to be afraid? Like, I want to be aware, but there's a fine line between aware and afraid. And let me just say this, and we can edit it out if it's too strong. I think it's dangerous when we start watching a death count on a ticker like it's a score in a baseball game. I think that kind of crosses a line. I think it puts us in a state where we have made entertainment out of misery, and then we become addicted to being afraid, and it kind of feels comfortable. It's like, oh, well, this is normal. You know one of the reasons Elijah ran from Jezebel? He was used to running. He had been hiding for three and a half years, so he did what came natural. And a lot of us, when we get in a fear state, it's because it feels familiar to us. This is like group therapy, isn't it? To know that sometimes we, we feel more familiar in a state of fear than we do in a state of faith. And what the prophet gave him was a different way to do math. I wrote in my notes, I said, this is miracle math. Somebody put it in the comments. This is miracle math. Miracle math is like this. You ready? There's more of us than them. Huh? Close your eyes and you'll see it. Because I'm not talking about what you can see. I'm talking about what's more real than what you can see. Close your eyes and you'll see it. This is miracle math. It's, it's a miracle math. It's like, Gideon, you have too many men. Too many men? 
I'm going to fight a battle. That's exactly what I need is soldiers. No, you got too many. Because if you go in with this many men, you will think it was you that won the battle. So when he gets down to 300, God says, Now go in the strength that you have. Now go. It's miracle math. It's like Jesus. There's 5,000 men and women and children. What do you have? Five loaves and two fish. It's not enough, right? Depends on whose calculator you're using. This is not Texas instruments. This is the Son of God. Put it in my hands. What you got in your house? A little bit of oil, a little bit of time, a little bit of sanity, a little bit of praise, just a weak Wi Fi connection. But I'm hooked up, hooked in to the presence of God, and God is a multiplier, and God is enough, and God is with me. This is miracle math. How long has he been dead? Three days. That's just right. This is miracle math. God said, do a, do a recalculation. I thought I was outnumbered, but I'm not. I thought it was over, but it's not. I thought it was done, but it's not. This is miracle math. Y'all say something in the chat while I button my shirt. Miracle math. Preaching so hard, I snapped my button open. Oh, well, that's all right. Because the word of the Lord came to the servant and said, There's more with us than with them. And then here's the prayer. And I'm closing, kind of. This is closing number one. Closing number one, lowercase a. Look at this. Miracle math, miracle math. Praise God. How many praise God for this word? Because we really need this in our life right now. We really need this in our life. He prayed after he encouraged him, don't be afraid. Then he said, Open my eyes. Open my eyes. There's the prayer. And, and that's, that's really not a physical statement, right? His eyes were working just fine. That's why he was scared. He's like, my, my vision is 2020, bro. I don't know what you're looking at. He's like, no, 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 no. Open his eyes. Paul called it the eyes of your heart. Perspective. Now, when the servant looked again, verse 17. And this is the whole message, okay? He opened his eyes after the Lord granted Elisha's request, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, let me tell you what's really wonderful about that verse is that when Elisha prayed, help did not come. Help was already there. So when Elisha prayed, you getting this? When he prayed, open his eyes, Holly, so that he may see, the Lord only had to show him what was already there. And we can pray for provision, and that's wonderful. And we can pray for healing, and we should. And we really need to pray for everybody who's a nurse or a doctor or a clerk or a law enforcement officer, our first responders, like all of it. We need to pray for each other. But the thing we need to pray for more than anything else is perspective. We're coming into a time where what is invisible is more valuable than what is visible, when everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. We're coming to a time where Peace is more profitable than Bitcoin. We're coming to a time where joy cannot rest on external circumstances. And when he looked, he saw the hills full of horses. They were already full. He just couldn't see it. He saw the hills full of chariots of fire. The fire was already burning. But you know what didn't happen when he prayed? And I don't know if you want to hear this or not. And LJ, we're not going to be able to put a B3 on this, but it's true and I need to say it. God did not answer Elisha's prayer by eliminating the enemy. Instead, he illuminated his presence. So faith is not a lever that I pull. God, make it stop. God is a lens. Faith is a lens that I look through to see that God has been there the whole time. He's with you right now, but I'm still scared. Abby said, I'm, I'm still scared. 
then just stay with me. Just stay with me. And whatever is going on up there, whatever is going on out there, you need to stay with your father right now, and you need to stay in faith right now. And the only way that we can really deal with fear, because if we stay in fear and then we stay in frustration and then we get stupid, because you are not very strategic when you're scared, so don't be afraid. Watch this. The only way to do that is to change the focus. To change the focus. Okay. The situation did not change in 2 Kings 6. The focus did. The only way I know to stop being afraid is to change what I'm focused on. And so I just need us right now to begin to ask the Lord to illuminate, not eliminate. Oh God, take the fear away. It doesn't work like that. Oh God, give me all the answers. Tell me the plan. I need the strategy. God said, before I give you the strategy, I want to give you your sight and shine light on your situation. Lord, shine your light in our hearts to show us who you are, not who we thought you were. Show us what it means to believe that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. Just right now in the chat or in the comments as a prayer, say, open my eyes. Open my eyes to see that there's more for me than against me. And you're like, Pastor, that's really cute, but that cliche is not very comforting right now. I feel alone. I know you feel alone, but you're not alone. And even if you're alone physically, and even if you're trying to figure out how to provide for a lot of people right now, many of us are. I'm right there with you. The scripture says, if God is for you, who can be against you? So the math goes like this. Me and God is greater than anything I face. Us and God, the church and God, we're not alone. Like right now, we're together. Right now, in this moment, together. Right now, we're fighting together, worshiping together, spreading the word of the Lord together. Right now, we've got more reasons to trust God than we do to doubt Him. Come on. We've got more victories behind us than we do reasons to fear in front of us. You hear me? We've got more reasons to be grateful right now than we do to be afraid right now. So come on and let's just, with a perspective of praise and with wide open eyes and even with lifted hands, come on, let your kids see you worshiping God. Let your kids see how you fight your battles. Let your kids see how you make it through a storm. Let a generation behold that we are that generation that will declare the works of the Lord. And there are more for us than against us. He is a mighty God of present help. I prophesy over your life today. You might be scared, but that doesn't stop the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And He is doing the most when we feel it the least. And I come to you today in Jesus' name from Elevation Church to let you know you're not alone. You are not alone. God is with you, and we are with you, and you are not alone. But I'm still scared, but you're not alone. But I'm still scared, but he's got you in the palm of his hand. How do, how do you know that? How do you know he's got me? How can you say that? I say it by faith, not by feeling. And I thank God for his presence with us in this moment. If you receive this word right now, just say right there, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it by faith. I receive joy, peace, wisdom. Amen. Wow. I can't wait to read all the comments and just see how God is using this message. Will you share it right there in the comments how God is using this message? Because I'm going to come right out of here and, and I'm going to look and see. And, and, and I want to hear from you a testimony of what you received from the Lord today. 
God is changing our focus. And one of the very best things we can do in this season is to continue to move the gospel forward. How many believe that? That we've got to keep moving forward by faith. No, we can't be those who shrink back. We can't be those who, who start to go within ourselves. And even, y'all calm down before I start singing Waymaker again. Bring it down. But I want to show you something before I have to go. And in just a moment, they're, they're going to show you a little clip because I, I want you to know that this church, this ministry, has never had more opportunity to reach more people. And God has been opening my eyes. You know, not every church right now is able to meet online like this. So many churches weren't ready for this. And, and you know how sometimes when you're just praying, like, God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What are you going to do for me? How are you going to do it for me? God's like, how about asking me what I want to do through you? That's like our whole church vision statement. See what God can do through you. And so one of the ways we shift the focus and get our eyes open is to look around and see how God can use us. And I want to thank all of you who give, who serve, who share the gospel. And this week, I wanted to make a move of faith for our church, and I want to show you what God did through you this week. This is for those who give. This is for those who call this their church. And don't just call it that, but invest in it like it's at, where your treasure is, your heart is also. And this week, I asked our team for outreach, not just the the meals that they feed. It's been hundreds of thousands of meals and all of the hygiene kits and all of the ways that we're supporting the, the teachers in our communities. It's, it's really amazing. But God put it on my heart to help a few churches. And we looked through the many relationships that God has given us in the church. And I was able to get on with our team for a Zoom call with some pastors this week and just bless them on your behalf. And if this doesn't bring a tear to your eye, I'm going to come check your pulse after this stream ends. But I want you to watch this and know there are more for us than against us. And somebody put it in the chat right now. We are not alone. Check this out. In the background, our. Um, our campus pastor, Larry Bry, is speaking with one of our friends who pastors a great church in Detroit, and we're trying to figure out just how to come alongside them during this time as they minister in Detroit. So we've got our team zooming in, and uh, in a minute I'm going to say hi to him and pray for him and, and share with him how Elevation Ministries, those of you who give, are going to help support yeah for their for their finances during this month so I'm going to go do that in a minute and so what are the needs that you're seeing rise up in your community um, the needs for encouragement to assuage some of the fears that people have we have individuals that at the church that are starting to to, to, to lose their jobs lose their business and so a lot of people from our church specifically have been affected financially for sure um, to where they're not able to work we're in that situation so like my wife she's not able to work um, and her her where she works isn't able to pay her during this season I was at the store Monday night and just saw a few people that attend our church and I just noticed the look on their face that they were fear filled like they didn't even come over and have a conversation they waved and said hey pastor and they kept going when typically they would have we would talk for 10 minutes in the aisle. So I think fears gripped a lot of a lot of people. Now you were supposed to move into your new building last weekend. Uh, two weekends ago, uh, March fifteenth was supposed to be our first Sunday, and that was the first Sunday we couldn't meet. We're we're keeping a positive attitude, but I think for the church at large, everybody's still trying to figure out like how do we pastor everybody through this? You know, and we're just watching what y'all are doing and we're just copying it. And so, you know, we created the online Facebook group to try to build conversations and- Don't watch okay. us, we're making it all up what? as we go. <laughs> What's, What's up, man of God? God? Steven. My heart's beating out my chest right now. You staying alive? <laughs> we're trying, we're trying. Pastor Steven. <laughs> What's up, man? Hey! Hey, hey man. Danielle. Pastor Steven, wow! <laughs> What's up, man of God? Doing <laughs> good, so how are you? Wow. Great to see your face. Oh, God. Great to see you, too. Great to see you, too. Wow. Wow. You staying safe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. So, 
staying indoors as much as we can, washing our hands, staying prayed up, uh, all, all that great stuff. But we're, 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 we're doing well. We're doing well by, by, by God's grace. In a way, it feels like we're all starting over, mm. figuring out how we do this. And yeah, we may be gathering back together in a few months, but it'll still be different. I just wanted to tell you all this. I, I prayed the day that they started canceling public gatherings and just asked God to show us something that we could do immediately that wasn't just like, hey, we're praying for you or just putting up Bible verses. You know, all that is good, but it has to go beyond that. And really felt like not only the Lord wanted me to encourage you, but also that we want to give you guys $20,000 to help you through this next season. Wow. We love you. Thank you so much. We're going to send $20,000 wow. to help you guys through this season. Mm. $20,000 just to help with this next month of expenses. Mm. Because we love you and what you're doing. And I wanted to give you guys uh, $20,000 to help over the next month as we're all figuring this out together. $20,000 to help with this next season. Wow. We wow. love you. Man, thank you so much, Pastor wow. Stephen. Wow. Thank you. You're the best. It's an honor to stand with you. Ooh, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I can't tell you how grateful we are just to know that you guys are paying attention and, and that you see what's going on out here. And um, man, I can't even I can't even express how grateful we are. You're not alone. Yeah. We're with you. Lord, I just thank you so much for uh, friends in ministry. And right now, we just all need your help and your wisdom and your strength. And I pray that your provision would continue to flow in all of its forms, not just financial provision, but your peace, your love, and your joy. And until the time we get to see each other again, Lord, we send them a virtual hug in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. I'm going to wow. give you a hug through the camera. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Just know we love you. Standing with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we love y'all. Well, God is using you in an amazing way, Elevation. We are so thankful for you. Yeah. Thank you for continuing to pray and connect and share and give. Yes. I want to particularly thank you for your giving in this time, for everyone who tithes and gives offerings. That's what enables us to be positioned not only to see a miracle, but to be a miracle. God is using you in a great way. wanted to encourage you also to continue to share your testimonies. Go right there in the comments where you're watching this. I'll be checking this week. Holly's going to be checking too. I love reading them. We love you. We thank you for your giving. We thank you for your partnership in the gospel. We're here for you.